tonight on CBC Vancouver News. And you need to continue as well to focus on everything possible to break those chains of transmission. Holding the line. And we simply cannot let up now. BC's firm message in the fight against COVID-19. Also, they're leaving it for somebody else to pick up. And I think that really as a society, uh, we can do better. Who does this? Used medical masks and gloves tossed onto streets in Metro Vancouver and and then we didn't think that was fair. It's actually excluding a lot of people. Cash and COVID-19. How the struggle becomes real when your local store isn't accepting money. This is CBC Vancouver News. And a very good evening to you as we begin a physical distancing version of CBC Vancouver News at 6. For the time being... I'll be co-hosting this newscast from my backyard here in North Vancouver. As you can see, Anita will be in the CBC studios in Vancouver. And Anita, we begin tonight with a firm and very clear message from BC's top doctor and our health minister. That's right. They say the COVID-19 curve appears to be bending, but insists now is not the time to ease up on the fight. This as they confirm 63 new cases and one more death since Saturday. The CBC's Tanya Fletcher joins us now. Tanya, what makes this latest death so significant? Well, the age is what's most concerning about this latest fatality, Anita. It was a man in his 40s. He died at his home, not in the hospital. And Provincial Health Officer Dr. Bonnie Henry cautions that even young people can be hit with severe cases. We know that there's been some young people in other parts of the country, including uh, someone in their 20s who's um, unfortunately died in Alberta over the last few days. It is tragic at any point in one's life, um, but it does go to show us that even younger people are not immune to the, the serious effects of, of COVID-19. So that brings us now to a total of 1,266 cases in B.C. and 39 deaths in total. Now, most of those fatalities were elderly. All but two of them were over the age of 70. And, uh, and you know, overall, Henry is encouraged to see B.C.'s percentage of new cases. It's been gradually slowing down. Okay, so Tanya, why does it appear cases in BC are starting to level off while well, they're still rapidly increasing in some other provinces? Well, it's some parts luck, some parts timing, and some parts preparedness, according to Henry. Take a look at this graph from our own Justin McElroy. You can see we compare the other provinces. This is the number of hospitalized cases in BC, the blue line, Ontario, which is red, and Quebec in purple. You can see the other two provinces are accelerating quite rapidly and at roughly the same rate. BC, meanwhile, has kept those hospitalizations relatively flat and so far they have not overwhelmed our health care system. The big question is why? I asked that to Dr. Bonnie Henry, especially because remember BC was one of the first provinces with confirmed cases and we took many of the same measures that those other provinces did at roughly the same time. Well, Henry says we cast a wide net early on to put out the sparks of potential hot spots and target potential outbreaks. We were able, I believe, to, to not have a lot of community spread before we recognized that we were um, with, that we had some community transmission and put on the very restrictive measures just prior to our March break. And I think that's a critical thing as well. So part of it was, um, uh, you know, the system that we had in place to, to detect cases in our communities here. And part of it was luck and part of it was timing, I believe. Now, you heard her mention there our March break. Our spring break was later than others, keep in mind. And BC was able to learn from Quebec, for example, which saw cases spike as their travelers returned. Anita? Tanya Fletcher live for us tonight. Thanks, Tanya. And applications have just opened, but already more than half a million people have applied for a $2,000 a month subsidy from the Canadian government. The Canada Emergency Response Benefit is for people who don't qualify for EI and have been laid off because of COVID-19. But as Tina Lovegreen reports, not everyone who needs financial help will get it. For 21 years, Linda Winterton has helped people bounce back after knee and hip surgery never thinking she'd have to lean on the government for support. It's one day at a time. I, I can have a good day and hike in the woods and the next day I'm just crying. Today, she applied for the emergency benefit after being forced to shut down her studio a few weeks ago because of COVID-19. I tried to do it online and failed and went to the phone number and after about four tries got through and was told that I was in. 
She says the automated system was super easy and was told the $2,000 accessible for four months will be in her account in just days. For me, it will pay for some food and uh, hopefully my portion of my mortgage and that's it. So the studio that I have, I will not have money for the commercial lease for May 1st. The benefit does little to keep her studio open and she fears she'll have to close it permanently when this is all over. I'm at the end of my career and can't really start a new business at 57. And not all Canadians are eligible for this benefit. To qualify, your income has to have dropped to zero and you must not have worked for the past two weeks before applying, meaning some contract workers and freelancers are left in the dark. This visual effects artist had to turn down a $300 paycheck. I had to email them, it was a really awkward email. I had to tell them, sorry, I can't invoice you or else I won't qualify for this benefit. And many students don't fit the criteria either because to qualify, you need to have earned at least $5,000 in 2019. There are a lot of students that don't work while they're doing their studies, but they take summer jobs. Same thing with certain grad students. Um, not all of them are TAs. The Prime Minister says he's aware there are problems. Whatever your situation, we are working to get you the help you need. And for some, like small business owners, they're hoping there is a much bigger plan ahead. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Now, many businesses are going cashless to try to help keep employees safe from the spread of COVID-19. But not everyone has luxury of paying with plastic. And as Jesse Johnston reports tonight, people who don't have debit or credit cards say the change is making it hard for them to shop. If you're shopping during the COVID-19 pandemic, you'd better be packing plastic. Many businesses fear the handling of money may put their employees at risk, so they're not accepting cash. Every dollar should count. This woman and her mother found that out last week when they went shopping and were told their money was no good. We didn't think that was fair. It's actually excluding a lot of people that don't have credit cards, don't have uh, debit cards. I have debit, but I didn't have enough in my bank account to actually cover. That, that cuts off a huge part of the population that isn't wired. And how is that all right in a democracy? So I'm Jean Swanson and I'm a city councillor. This Vancouver City Councillor says she's heard similar complaints from people with low incomes who don't have debit or credit cards. I mean, I understand it's really hard to be a store worker in these times and I'm really thankful that so many people are working in stores. I think they all should have raises and I'm just hoping they can wear gloves and accept money. There's no law that requires companies to accept cash, but the Bank of Canada is recommending businesses do it anyway, especially during the pandemic. The BC Centre for Disease Control says the risk of contracting the virus through touching money is low, but still, it recommends thoroughly washing your hands afterwards. The Retail Council of Canada recommends businesses use contactless pay systems, like tapping your debit card whenever possible, but it says there should be exceptions. In some cases, uh, they may have all manner of financial challenges, and we don't want to exacerbate that, and so we think it's important that cash still be an option where it feasibly can. But that decision is ultimately up to businesses, and many say cash is no longer king. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, drive through COVID-19 testing site is now up in Burnaby Central Park. Only healthcare workers or patients referred by their family doctor can be tested at the site. The city has provided the parking lot, the RCMP are providing security, and Fraser Health is supplying nursing staff. The low supply of personal protective equipment in doctor's offices prompted the idea for a safer environment to examine people who are showing symptoms. Patients will be swabbed if they meet guidelines, and there are three portable examination rooms if needed. And dozens of Asian restaurants are banding together to show their support for frontline workers. They're donating more than 2,500 meals to lower mainland hospitals. The walk was fired up this morning at Richmond's Fortune Terrace restaurant. It's one of more than 30 eateries committing to Chopsticks for Healthcare Heroes campaign. Laid-off staff were called in to work, cooking and assembling meal donations. That's despite the restaurant's struggle with finances. Many Chinese restaurants saw major declines in business since January because of COVID-19. 
But the owner of this restaurant says this is all worth it. They're actually risking their life for us to be safe. So we have to do something for them. And they don't, they don't have to worry about the meal while they're saving lives. The first of 2,900 meal boxes were dropped off at VGH this afternoon. More will be sent to Mount St. Joseph Hospital. Organizers say hospitals in Burnaby and Richmond have also reached out for deliveries. And with more than 27,000 Canadians registered as being in India at the moment, some are feeling relief. They arrived at YVR today on a government-organized flight. Jen Burrett is live with us now for more on this. Uh, Dan, just this was one of a handful of flights basically said to arrive in the next few weeks. Where do we stand with getting everyone from India home? Well, Global Affairs has admitted it will not be able to bring every Canadian home from India, Anita. Some Canadians did get home today, landing at YVR, as you said, this afternoon after a flight from London that originated from Delhi. One of the largest problems has been logistics. India is on lockdown. Getting to the airport is a bit of a challenge, especially in New Delhi, for many who are hours away by car or train. Global Affairs has arranged some flights outside the capital in Amritsar and Bangalore, but these flights only hold a few hundred people. And travelers say the main agency booking their flights has been disorganized and it's not issuing tickets until the morning of the flight. It's leaving passengers unable to even get to the airport. But the majority of travelers stuck in India have not heard back as to whether they will be even the, one of the lucky ones issued a ticket. Those who did arrive in Canada today, they are expected to quarantine for 14 days. No stopping at grocery stores, not going anywhere else, straight home and into isolation. As our health minister stressed time and again, it's the law. Anita. Dan Burrett, thank you very much. All right, time to check in with our meteorologist, Brett Soderholm, who is live again tonight at the Work From Home CBC Vancouver Weather Centre. Brett, a gorgeous day on the South Coast. <laughs> It certainly was, Anita, and it's good to see you back over here. We are going to be dealing with these conditions that we are experiencing right now, really, for much of this week. So if you're enjoying these conditions, they're relatively clear skies out right now. Don't even need that much of a jacket. This is going to be the trend all the way through Friday. So it is going to be good, but it is going to be, of course, very tempting for you to get out there, and only if you are capable of doing physical distancing should you do that. But I want to show you some of our current temperatures right now, just to give you a rough idea of how this is working out. So if you're closer to the water temperatures right around 10 degrees or so but as you go farther inland like Pitt Meadows even Abbotsford we're gonna see temperatures there into the teens and as we go throughout the next couple of hours and into the overnight period you're gonna notice relatively clear skies mean it's gonna be once again on the chillier side so I would say on average places are gonna be going down to anywhere between 2 and 4 degrees across the whole region and that is of course gonna be brought to our tomorrow morning at least is gonna be met with a lot more sunshine and temperatures right back to where we would expect them to be for this time of year. In general, we'd be seeing over the next couple of hours at least high temperatures getting back up to about 12 or 14 degrees by the afternoon, and then we're going to be dealing with those conditions essentially all week. So I will have a more complete provincial look at that forecast when I come back. All right, Brett, we'll check in with you later. Thank you. Well, a lot of questions right now about medical supplies, how to get them and how to donate them. Some of the most needed items in British Columbia include these, respirators, all kinds of them, disposable half or full face pieces. Also masks, eye protection, gowns, and gloves. Donations of hand sanitizer and medical grade disinfectant are also badly needed. As for where you can get the information, safecarebc.ca is a one-stop online resource for BC businesses with medical supplies who are looking to donate them. And the City of Vancouver has giveahandvancouver.ca for a large quantity donations of medical supplies, cleaning products, or food. The site also has information on how you can make smaller scale donations. And residents who want to donate money can do so through the City of Vancouver's Community Response Fund at vancouverfoundation.ca. Some good info there indeed. And just a reminder, you can watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. The free app is also where you can find other CBC programs. CBC Vancouver also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. 
And as COVID-19 symptoms worsen, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been moved to an intensive care unit. We'll have more on his condition right after the break. As always, thank you so much for watching our live stream where we are ad free during this television commercial break. All right, video conferencing has become invaluable as health officials urge physical distancing, but how secure are these online communication tools? Our Zuleika Nathu looks into one of the more popular apps and why it's facing growing criticism over privacy and security. Brown Muses Board of Education. And Dennis yeah. Johnson was defending his doctoral dissertation last week students of color were not achieving at the same rate as when this happened. I see a circle on my screen and then I see another circle and then um, another shape and it's like it's a penis. And then I see the on letters N-I-G-G-E-R. We blurred the content, but Johnson's faculty saw the full effect of what's known as Zoom bombing. Malicious users invade a chat group, often with profanity and racial slurs. It's happening in Canada, too. They started shouting racial epithets. They shouted the N-word. Maya Roy says a 250-person town hall she hosted earlier this week for the YWCA was attacked. It's not just a couple of kids uh, messing around with your Zoom call or with your Zoom meeting. They are using hate speech. The FBI told CBC News it's investigating a handful of what it calls video teleconferencing hijackings. But it also said the best way to avoid Zoom bombing is to follow these tips. Add a password to any online meeting. Change settings so only the host can share their screen and don't share a link to meetings on social media. The University of Toronto's renowned tech research group, the Citizen Lab, says Zoom is fine for a virtual beer with friends or a book club. But its latest report also says Zoom's encryption is flawed and the platform should not be used for private meetings like health or legal appointments. If there's uh, a need to discuss uh, confidential or sensitive data over Zoom, I'd recommend potentially looking for, for another way uh, to do that. Zoom told CBC News it's trying to be proactive about fixes and in a blog post apologized for overstating the security properties of its encryption. Zuley Kanathu, CBC News, Los Angeles. Zoom, one of the most popular apps right now. A lot of people hadn't even heard of it really until uh, this COVID-19 pandemic and now millions of users around the world, but some food for thought there. All right, stick with us. We will be back in a few moments with more headlines on COVID-19. as Britain's Prime Minister becomes the first Western national leader to enter intensive care for treatment of COVID-19. Boris Johnson entered hospital for routine tests just yesterday, and as Margaret Evans reports, he was diagnosed with COVID-19 late last month. Leave a light on for Britain's Prime Minister. Boris Johnson was moved to the intensive care unit of this South London hospital this evening. A statement from Downing Street calling it a precaution should he require ventilation to aid his recovery. Johnson was diagnosed with COVID-19 last month, delivering video messages from quarantine, calling his symptoms mild and saying he was still in charge. But symptoms persisted. Alas, I still have uh, one of the symptoms, a minor symptom of, I, have a, I still have a temperature. He was last seen publicly on Thursday, emerging from number 10 to clap for healthcare workers before returning to isolation. 
Friday, he was taken to hospital for what Downing Street described as precautionary tests, that same language. This morning, his Twitter account said he was in good spirits, and at the daily coronavirus briefing late in the afternoon, officials were still insisting it was business as usual, albeit from a hospital bed. The Prime Minister is in charge. He's leading uh, the government uh, and giving directions as and when are required. Just a few hours later, the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, was again in front of the cameras, looking a little shell-shocked, saying he'd been deputised by the Prime Minister before he went into intensive care. The focus of the government will continue to be on making sure at the Prime Minister's direction all the plans for making sure that we can defeat coronavirus and pull the country through this challenge will be taken forward. But there will be deep concern here tonight over a potential leadership vacuum. Government strategy so far has been ravaged by critics and judged by declining public support. But Boris Johnson is also one of the country's most identifiable figures for fans and critics alike. And the shock waves from this news will be deep. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Well, south of the border, Americans are being warned to brace themselves as the U.S. is about to see a peak in hospitalizations and deaths from COVID-19. Today, the number of dead passed the 10,000 mark and confirmed cases, more than 360,000. As Katie Simpson tells us, fines for breaking physical distancing rules in New York are now twice as much. Every patient inside this New York emergency room has COVID-19. It's one of three hospitals in the state fully dedicated to treating the disease. I think it's emotionally hard to prepare for this level of sickness and suffering. Reporters spent three hours inside, but had to stop multiple interviews because of this. Code 99, code 99, code 99. Repeated calls for code 99, which means a patient needs immediate help to keep breathing. We're having, uh, I would say, 10 code 99s every uh, every 12 hours at least. Nearly 600 people died in New York State in the past 24 hours, a slight increase from the previous day. But overall, hospitalizations are down. So are ICU admissions and intubations. Those are all good signs and again would suggest a possible flattening of the curve. Still, the number of deaths is so staggering, funeral homes can't keep up. 9-11 was horrific, but it was a singular event. What makes this harder is you are, you're, you don't know when it's going to end. The mayor says the city may have to temporarily bury bodies on public land if they run out of morgue space. We're going to have a rough week. We're going to have maybe a rough little more than a week. And, but there's tremendous light at the end of that tunnel. I the president's preference for optimism was undercut by a stunning admission from his top doctor. Don't expect life to fully return to normal until there's a vaccine. That. If back to normal means acting like there never was a coronavirus problem, I, I don't think that's going to happen until we do have a situation where you can completely protect the population. Best case scenario, a vaccine can be ready in 12 to 18 months, though some experts say that prediction is ambitious. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Okay, medical masks are a necessity for frontline workers, but today Canada's top health officials concluded cloth masks may have a place for those who unknowingly have the virus but aren't showing symptoms. As Salima Shivji reports, health officials are calling it advice rather than a recommendation. 10-minute face mask. It's spread uh, quickly. And the elastic is going to go here. A viral effort. Or just leave your needle in the down position. To share tips for how to make your own mask. These are really simple. They're With more and more countries making them mandatory for the general public, even as Canadian officials were more hesitant. But today, a shift. We need to do everything um, that we can. It seems a sensible thing to do. So I think we recommend that Canadians can uh, take this additional measure. Not everywhere, she says, but at the grocery store and on public transit, where physical distancing is a struggle. It's a significant change of policy on a message that's been shifting all week. That gives you a false sense of uh, confidence. All that to say that it is a personal choice. But for this ER doctor, wearing a cloth mask out in public is just common sense. He's been saying it for days. If we can put this blanket prevention, it makes my job easier. 
and my colleagues' life safer. The new advice from Canada comes after the U.S. changed its mind. It's only a recommendation. It's voluntary. With the CDC now recommending Americans wear non-medical masks. And after more studies that show people who don't show symptoms of COVID-19 can still be highly contagious. For some, Canada's delay is a sign officials here are too dependent on other experts at the CDC and the World Health Organization. It meant that we had quite a number of transmissions, um, onward transmission that resulted in community transmission that might have been prevented had we acted sooner. Health officials here are very clear. Wearing a cloth mask is just an option and it can't be used on its own without other proven methods to stop the spread of the virus. Washing your hands and staying far away from others. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. It is an old and familiar message, don't litter. So why are so many people throwing potentially contaminated waste anywhere they please? As the CBC's Deborah Goble reports tonight, it's a preventable concern in the battle against COVID-19. On streets, in parking lots, even in parks, you see them everywhere these days. Used gloves and masks tossed not into garbage bins, but onto the ground. It's not only littering, it's also selfish, says Vancouver City Councillor Pete Fry. If they're contaminated enough that you don't want to carry them in your hand and, and put them in your personal garbage, which obviously people aren't doing, then you're really sort of passing the problem on for somebody else. At a time when so many people are working so hard to keep us all healthy, it's almost incomprehensible that people would do this, says Dr. Mariam Zainadine. If the wearer has COVID-19 or touched a surface carrying the virus, it can present a real danger. What you're littering it has multiple particles of the virus sitting on there and can be sitting on there for, um, for days. And whoever, um, poor soul, that has to dispose of your garbage will then again, unfortunately, be, dis be um, exposed. So seriously... How could anyone think that's where they go? The mayor of Port Coquitlam is so incensed, his community is considering hefty fines. If you think something is contaminated, leaving it for others is about the most selfish thing you could possibly do. With municipal and park board workers most at risk, if things get any worse, the city of Vancouver may also consider fines. And I think it's the anxiety for those who are picking up after you who have no idea whether or not you had COVID-19, whether or not you were in a COVID-19 uh, area or in touching lots of things. There is, he says, really no excuse for such irresponsible behavior. The whole idea of social distancing and staying at home is so that we can collectively um, help our community. So by you disposing of your masks and gloves on the ground in the parking lot, uh, again, then you're not thinking about the community. You're thinking about purely yourself. Take your mask off from the back first and remove gloves from inside out. Then, for goodness sake, she says, throw them safely in the garbage. Deborah Goebel, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, we heard it again today from Dr. Bonnie Henry. And right across the country, we've heard officials say this is a critical time. These next days and weeks are going to tell us if the physical distancing is actually working to help flatten the curve. Thomas Daigle looks at how the fight is going in Canada's two hardest hit provinces, Ontario and Quebec. From a bird's eye view in Quebec, it looks like the crisis just keeps deepening. With more confirmed cases than any other province and now over a hundred deaths. And yet, from the Premier today, a glimmer of hope. We uh, may see the light at the end of the tunnel. But we must continue to do everything we can to win the battle against the virus. He's encouraged by the most recent number of hospitalizations, with only a small single-digit daily increase. Keep it up, and Quebec's premier predicts the peak may be near. This doctor, though, says, hold the optimism. If we see uh, two or three days of declines, um, particularly in cases, uh, then um, there may be reason to say we may have reached the peak. Quebec may have more known cases only because it's ramped up testing, including at drive through sites. But that doesn't tell the whole story. Consider intensive care capacity, 
Quebec has 164 ICU beds occupied, with another 633 available. Neighbour Ontario has 216 cases in ICUs, with 751 spots to spare. The trouble here is with testing. Not everyone who needs it gets it. Just ask Agnes Sokolovska. Without being able to get tested, she thinks she unknowingly got her parents sick with COVID-19. I've been thinking over and over again, when, when did I get it from? And it's just killing me. After working through a backlog in results, Ontario is ramping up tests. And the top public health doctor, David Williams, says he hopes it will show the curve flattening. I'd like to think so, but let's stay tuned. To be clear, there are plenty more cases to come. Across the country, COVID-19 is still bound to get worse before it gets better. Thomas Dagg, the CBC News, Toronto. Coming up, all your questions about masks answered. Dr. Deborah Money joins us live. Send in your questions via Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. You can also call us 604-662-6801. And at 6.35, here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. I also know that it's been challenging for many people. 
And I want to really encourage us all to continue to be kind. 63 new cases of COVID-19 in BC, bringing the total number to 1,266. One more person has died, a man in his 40s at home, so a total of 39 deaths in our province. Dr. Bonnie Henry says BC's curve, which appears to be flattening, is thanks to luck, timing, and measures implemented early on also. Here just in the neighborhood, they're on every block. There seems to be lying in the gutters, the blue or black or white uh, latex gloves and the masks just sort of discarded where people left them. Disturbing discoveries on streets and sidewalks around Metro Vancouver used medical masks and gloves. People are being reminded to dispose of those kinds of products properly and help stop the spread of the virus. It's actually excluding a lot of people that don't have credit cards, don't have uh, debit cards. I have debit, but I didn't have enough in my bank account to actually cover. Cash and the COVID-19 crisis. With a growing number of businesses refusing to handle money, many low-income people in Metro Vancouver are finding it increasingly difficult to pay for what they need during this difficult time. All right, throughout this pandemic, we are connecting you with the experts. We're taking your questions and putting them to doctors, public health officials, and anyone else who can keep you informed. Today, Dr. Deborah Money is live to talk about masks. So send us your questions now via Facebook and YouTube in our live stream chats. You can also email or phone us. Okay, Dr. Money, let's get started here. Dana wants to know what materials work best for homemade masks. So really any material that would be um, uh, substantive enough to block uh, the moisture of a droplet that you might cough or sneeze into the mask. It's designed to protect you, uh, uh, not to protect you so much as to protect others. Okay, so are there any safety implications of the various materials that are available? Um, this is from Pam on Facebook. She's saying, you know, things like filters for homemade masks, HEPA filters versus coffee filters versus blue shop towels. What's the difference and how safe are they? It would probably be better to just simply use a material like a cotton type of material that was thick enough, perhaps to layer, rather than using these other products. Um, we're not trying to filter the virus out. We're just trying to have some sort of um, uh, a physical barrier. Skylar Hugh Green on Facebook says, they tell us if we're infected with COVID-19 to wear a mask to prevent particles from getting others sick. But on the other hand, they tell us wearing masks won't protect us from getting the virus. So how is a mask going to pre protect, uh, prevent rather COVID-19 droplets from getting out if they won't stop them from going in? You, all you're trying to do is provide a physical barrier to moisture. You're not actually completely uh, creating a barrier against the virus. And the idea is that you're still doing the physical distancing, you're still washing your hands, you're still staying at home as much as you possibly can. We really need to emphasize those elements um, rather than the masks per se. Okay, Dr. Money is taking your questions. If you do have any, uh, send them to us in the live chat on YouTube, on Facebook, or you can give us a call or send us an email. We're talking masks right now, but if you do have any other health questions, she will answer those as well. Zona on Facebook asks, can I sanitize my cloth face mask by ironing it? Should I put it on the highest steam setting or iron with dry heat? You want to wash it in uh, ideally hot water. Um, and that's the most the best way to uh, get rid of a virus from any household uh, fabric. So ironing per se is not going to be the best method. Okay, so same thing with um, sanitizing. You know, we've talked. We people have talked about wiping it with a Lysol cloth and all that. Really, washing it in hot water is the best. That's the best bet. A thorough wash is the best bet and thoroughly dried. Okay. Um, Svegnum asks, would a face shield? over a cloth mask offer even better protection from incoming droplets as opposed to using either individually? So I, that sort of implies perhaps the use of a medical mask with a face shield. And we are really, really urging the public not to purchase or acquire medical masks, medical masks with face shields, or certainly not N95 masks. Those are desperately needed by the frontline healthcare workers, and we really do not want to deplete that supply by the public going out to try and procure those in any way. 
We have and, s- and no, the mask, the shield is likely not terribly helpful in, in the general public setting. Okay, so we have seen people, you know, making their own types of shields, even to put on their own cloth masks, and you're recommending that's not really the best way to go? Well, I guess the point is, why are you out and about with that sort of level of protection on? If you um, don't need to be out, don't be out. Um, I think what Dr. Tam and our other public health leaders have been saying is they may be helpful if you must be in a, in a, say, a grocery store or a pharmacy or in public transit where you have a wee bit challenge with the physical distancing, uh, and then those may be helpful. But again, it's for the protection of others more than the, for the protection of yourself. So the biggest thing is if you're, not, if you're having a cough or, or feeling unwell, stay at home. Don't go out. Okay, I've been wondering about this next one as well. Um, Jennifer wants to know about eyes and how the virus gets in, you know, through touching eyes, things like that. She's saying, how important is wearing glasses or eye protection in addition to using face masks? Well, I think certainly if you have the reason to wear glasses or you choose to wear glasses outside, it does tend to mean you're not going to be touching your eyes. Um, It's tears and the secretions from your nose and from your mouth that are the things that are infectious with these kind of viruses. And then what happens is you take those and you put them onto solid surfaces by touching. And then if somebody immediately touches that, that's where they can acquire it. So if the glasses are helpful in, in decreasing your likelihood of doing that, then they're, they're perfectly fine to do. Okay, and sticking with touching your face, a Twitter user asks, my child touches her face constantly when wearing a cloth face mask. Would she be better off still wearing one or not wearing one? Well, that I think um, is a comment that Dr. Tam made earlier, which is the worry that um, a mask gives you a false sense of security, but you're not pre- you're not doing these other things. So you're touching your face more often because it's annoying or irritating, and you're maybe not paying as close attention to the other uh, parameters. So to be perfectly honest, if you've got a child that is doing that, you'd keep her away from other uh, people who might be infectious, make sure she's at a distance from folks, and um, and get her washing. Um, and maybe the mask isn't ideal for that child. Okay, you talked about washing as the best way to get rid of uh, viruses and bacteria, but Henry is wondering, can a microwave really deactivate viruses? If so, on what kinds of things? Can, you know, takeout orders, mail, packaged goods? He's wondering if that's something that he should do. It's not generally recommended. Microwaves do uh, destroy microorganisms depending on how long you've got the setting on and the kind of product you're putting in a microwave. But uh, that would not be something that we would be recommending as something comes into your house. If you think something might be contaminated, you can wipe it down and then after you've handled it, wash your hands. Um, But generally speaking, things that are you know, a delivery package or something is unlikely to be a source of infection for a household. Dr. Money, Jessica emailed in to ask if there's any more research being done on how this virus affects pregnancies in terms of mothers and their babies. Interesting. You should ask that question. It's very foremost in my mind. Um, We have been looking at the world literature so far, and um, the uh, pregnant women do not seem to be more adversely affected than others by it. But we are, in fact, launching a uh, Canada-wide multi-province a process to assess how pregnancies are going um, in this COVID pandemic time and making sure that we understand in the Canadian context how uh, a pregnancy will um, uh, succeed and is there any adverse outcomes that we should be more conscious of. Okay, Thomas asks, what risks or threats do dog owners have to worry about in regards to COVID-19 um, and what precautions should be taken, if any? You know, although I I understand there's been the occasional report of this virus being in domesticated animals, um, that is not thought to be a primary source uh, of this infection, nor a real primary way of transmitting it. So general hygiene after handling your dog or or getting saliva from the dog would be normal, and and hopefully you'd wash your hands after that. But uh, we don't have any particular precautions for pets at this time. We have another mask question here. Michelle wants to know, I tried using a cloth face mask while jogging outdoors, but felt like I couldn't breathe properly. Do you have a recommendation for covering my face while exercising? 
You know, if you're exercising in a solitary way in a large open space, it's probably unnecessary to cover your your um, face with a mask. Um, and so, to be honest, I don't know that it's necessary in that setting. Uh, and I think it is something that when you're breathing heavily during exercise, it's going to be a very awkward thing. If it's cold and you think you can put a, maybe a loose scarf or something in front, you could choose to do that. But I, I think these masks are not really even being considered to be helpful in that outdoor, very distant kind of way that people are um, exercising properly with really, really good uh, physical distancing. Dr. Money, thank you so much for answering our questions today. And we are going to take a short break and we'll be back with more news coming up. You are looking at a live shot of Tofino. Wow, gorgeous day out there. Temperatures dropped down to the freezing mark overnight, but some good news for the morning. Brett's here with the full forecast after the break. Once again, meteorologist Brett Soderholm joins us now live from the Work From Home Weather Center. What a stunning day on the South Coast, Brett. 
It was absolutely gorgeous, and I know you and I are a big fan of these kind of conditions, and guess what? We're going to be in a luck this whole week looking at very sunny and very quiet weather conditions. So interestingly enough, I wanted to take some time to talk to you about a phenomenon that's going to be happening tomorrow night, and it's not exactly weather-related, but I think you're probably going to be interested. It has to do with what is called the pink supermoon, and I put a board together to show you some of the facts about this. First and foremost, what's a supermoon? Well, that essentially means that you're going to be seeing the moon be a little bit brighter than it normally is. And this is because the moon is going to be at its closest point to the Earth that it will be in the entire year. But here's the thing. It's not pink. You're not going to actually see the color pink in the moon. That name comes from the fact that wildflowers tend to bloom at this time of year. Or in our case, I think that would be very specifically for our cherry blossoms. Now, at this point in time, the moonrise is actually going to occur before the sun sets. So tomorrow evening at about 7.30, that's when you should be looking toward the sun, at, sorry, away from the sun looking toward the moon on the opposite side of the horizon there and you're going to be getting quite the treat. Now the cool thing is all of this is going to be visible widespread across BC because of the fact that we have a high pressure area dominating across the entire province. This means the skies are going to be clear. That's of course going to be chilly at night but in general that will give really good viewing conditions for this moon no matter where you are across the province. In terms of this condition we're going to be seeing this all the way throughout the week. The only exception is far to the north and west where we could be dealing a little bit of rain for places like Haida Gwaii. But in terms of our temperatures, this is one thing that we're going to notice, a stark contrast from where we were last week. We're going to be looking at temperatures widespread across southern portions of BC into essentially the low teens, maybe even into that 15 degree range come Wednesday. And that's going to apply for pretty well everyone here on the south coast and especially into the interior. Now before I leave you here, I do want to mention about our five day forecast. Boy, it is looking really quite nice. Not a lot of rain in the forecast. And that could be a bit concerning. We are a little dry at this point in time. However, temperatures above seasonal for the next foreseeable future. So if you are going outside and maintaining your physical distance, this is also a really good reminder. Put on that sunscreen. You're going to need it. The sun is getting stronger and stronger by the day. But of course, do get a breath of fresh air as you can. All right. Thanks very much, Brett. Well, how are students, parents, and teachers handling the challenge of online learning? After the break, we're going to talk to families who lack the technology. How are they trying to make it all work? Stay with us.
Well, COVID-19 may have closed schools right across the country, but the classes, while well, they go on. At-home learning programs already running in Alberta and here in British Columbia have now launched in Ontario and on Prince Edward Island. But as Deanna Suvanak johnson explains, the learning hasn't been without its challenges. Ontario's Premier was reasonably hopeful about at least one thing today, that students will hit the books. It is critical that during this time, kids keep learning. Education must continue. Though it's not learning as usual. Some families have been given computers for their kids, but if you live in rural Ontario, as our interview showed, there's no fast fix for slow internet. I feel like we're at a disadvantage because we don't have internet that works in a reliable way. And I feel bad for my kids because I wish they could get the full experience. In the home of the Allens, six-year-old twins are back to grade one online. You know, I feel like I say over and over and over again throughout the day, like, I'm only one person. I can only do one thing at a time. In between assisting them, their parents, both teachers, are trying to do their own work. I can't imagine an activity that one of my kids, my children's teachers, could assign that they would do completely on their own. That's just not possible. But at least she can make her kids attend their online classes. Those teaching older kids have noticed lower engagement since grades are not being docked for not attending, at least for now. One of my students today for the online session I had, she was asking me how, how is attendance really going to be marked? Is it going to be showing up on a report card as usual? And I couldn't give her an answer. But problems aside, this professor of education says the key is to keep kids involved and doing the work. Inevitably, if we if we move towards um, a set of expectations that are mandatory, it's going to be punitive towards some kids who are not in a position for any number of reasons to uh, take full advantage of those resources. Since we're not going to be presenting it in school... And Still, this is just day one on the steep learning curve that teachers, students and parents are on together. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, Easter is just around the corner for many people, and we have another sign tonight that this year's celebrations will be, well, a little different than any other. Take a look at these less than traditional Easter chocolates. This pastry chef in Greece is making some unique confections, honoring doctors treating COVID-19 patients. Each chocolate bunny is wearing a face mask and gloves. Of course, also a needle and coronavirus cell with them, symbolizing the hope for a vaccine. The chef says each one is meant as a message and a wish to stay healthy. Boy, when I saw that early, the level of detail with the needle and the coronavirus cell, pretty amazing. <laughs> Very creative, a very uh, important message as well from uh, the pastry chef in Greece, that's for certain. Absolutely. All right, uh, that is uh, just about it uh, for tonight from my uh, backyard studio here in North Vancouver, Anita, our first uh, physical distancing version of CBC Vancouver News at 6. But this is the reality for a, lo a lot of people right now, just simply uh, having to work from home. I know that many of our colleagues at CBC uh, where you are right now, the building is, uh, it's not empty, but almost empty. So Pretty much, uh, yeah. important that we uh, lead by example and show that this is, uh, this is the way we're doing things for the time being. So stay healthy, stay safe, and if you can, stay home. <laughs> well, I think it went pretty well, Mike. You can always find our news program online, cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local news is at, uh, going to be tomorrow at 6 o'clock. Mike will be back in his backyard. And tonight we are leaving you with a look at that pink moon coming up over Metro Vancouver. Have a wonderful night.